Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. This beautiful day for us, and we are quite aware that it's not a beautiful day for some other folks. And we continue to pray for them. But we do know that the God who controls the oceans, the weather, the seas, calms all those storms, the God we praise today. And our prayer this morning is that God will open up the heavens in this place because we want to see Him. Let's stand together. For this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awaken in desire, will burn. Thank you for being here. For those of you that are members, you've got an opportunity to tear this off after you filled it out in a place of service. All right, for those of you that are visiting with us maybe for the first time, we're glad you're here. There's an opportunity for you if you'd wish to be contacted by one of the staff or have questions. Uh, you're welcome to please fill this out and then pass it and put it in the offering plate when it's passed. Let's pray together. Lord, we lift you up above all else. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. And Lord, we come to you this morning confessing our shortfallings, our shortcomings, places where you've told us to do things that we simply haven't done, the things that we have done that don't please you. We confess those to you and ask you to create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much you were willing to send your son to die for us so that we could live for you and have that eternal life. And Lord, this morning our hearts are heavy with uh, all the storms, all the struggles, all the losses that we've seen both in life and in properties. And Lord, you are the God of all things. And so we pray now, Lord, that if it's your will, that you kill the storm. 
But Lord, let us pay attention to the signs that you're giving us. That we should draw closer to you and Lord, keep us where you want us to be. And we know it's all in your perfect plan and your perfect will. So, Lord, for those that are sick today and hurting, we pray that you'll give an extra measure of comfort and healing. All for your glory and nothing for ourselves. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
name of Jesus. And it says, all the world will praise your great name. This morning, all over the world, Christians like us are praising the name of Jesus while the rest of the world hasn't a clue. But one day, all of us are. We continue to proclaim that there is no other name but the name of Jesus. Let's stand together and let's continue our worship. together this morning to turn our attention to God's Word. If you would join us in Matthew chapter 9. Last week we looked at the church at Antioch where believers, the disciples, were first called Christians. And we looked at characteristics that led them to being called Christians, that name being given to them. And one of those characteristics, the last one we looked at, was that of generosity. That they gave yes to the offering that was going to the Jerusalem church after a famine had been predicted to take over the whole, to take, uh, to affect the whole region. But then I pointed out it wasn't just that, that they gave of their people, that they sent Barnabas and, and Paul, their pastor and associate pastor, off to begin what we would know as the first missionary journey. And they, this church impacted the whole world because of their generosity. 
And it's off of that that I want us to begin looking for the next few weeks, this idea, this topic, the subject of generosity. And many times we think of generosity, we immediately think that of money. But generosity is much more than that. And I want us to look at that today to the key of generosity. I believe we were never going to be generous people with what we have unless we become people of compassion. So notice in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus has been healing people in the last chapter 8 and chapter 9, been restoring life back to those, and he comes to verse 35, where Matthew says that Jesus went through all the towns and synagogues, all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Two years ago, the Atlantic Magazine had an article about a 49-year-old man in Rio de Janeiro by the name of Jao. Jao was in the insurance business, and he was known for being a penny pincher. A tight wad and many other descriptions had been given to Jao. As often happens in this case, Jao suffered a stroke unexpectedly and had a recovery period that when he recovered and began to get where he could work once again, he quit his job and instead used some of his resources to buy a food cart where every day he went out into the streets of Rio and gave away food that he himself had cooked. People couldn't understand. There were many who demanded that he take money from them, or that he didn't charge anything. But he said that his newfound generosity was a result from seeing death up close. His doctor began to wonder what had happened to him and concluded that he suffered brain damage during the stroke. Sent him to researchers who said that yes, that's what happened, that the brain releases chemicals when we are generous, and that makes us feel good. And, and they believe that Jao's stroke damaged the parts of his brain that previously interfered with generosity. Well, you may know instances where people had close encounters with death, and it changed them. But all of us have had critical events in our life that make us see how important it is to know the true and godly purpose in life. Our conversion to Christ should bring about that change. But in reality, most of us require other reminders, other crises in our life to keep us, to keep showing us what is most important in our life. And so today I want us to again look from this passage about generosity. And again, generosity is more than just being generous with our resources, with our financial resources, with our money. Generosity is being generous with your time. It's how you use your experiences, the lessons that you've learned, the difficulties that you've gone through in life. God doesn't waste any of those, but in each instance, He teaches us so that we can pass on those lessons, those lessons to somebody else. Generosity is how you use your car. It's how you use your home. It's how you use your job. It's how you use your family. It's how you use everything that you have and all that you are. And this morning, before we get to the points on your notes, I read something that jumped out to me that I want you to consider today. And that's that the future shape of Christianity comes down to the generosity of Christians. Think about that for a little bit. That the future shape of what Christianity will look like comes down to how generous you and I are today. That's true financially, that as we give, we give to missions, we have the opportunity to impact people that we would not be able to give without that giving, or we would not be able to impact without that giving. Therefore, the shape of Christianity is impacting. It's as you invest in other people, as you give of your time, as you share of your resources, you have the ability to shape the future of Christianity. As a parent and as a grandparent, that ought to be something that you write down and that you consider 
in the weeks and months ahead. To understand that our generosity or our selfishness will impact the future of Christianity. As a side note, today many of you are going to be celebrating the beginning of the NFL season. You're going to, some of you have vowed not to watch any NFL games because many of the players refuse to stand during the national anthem of our country. Or if you do watch, you're still not in favor of that. But we need to understand that there's no difference in NFL players who will not stand for the national anthem and Christians who will not tithe. There's no difference in a player refusing to stand and honor our country than it is for a Christian who refuses to be generous and honor our Lord through what we have and who we are. Let us become as disgusted about that as we are about being an American when people will not respect our country. For our God is greater than America. And we need to be worried about Him receiving more honor than America receives. But the reality is, you and I will never become people of generosity until we become people of compassion. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. And then he goes on as kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I believe Paul listed that because compassion is the undergarments that we put on first, that then everything else we put on after that. Because we can't be a person of patience. We can't be a person of humility of gentleness, of kindness, until we are a person of compassion. And Jesus has been demonstrating his compassion for people who are hurting. He's been healing them of their physical diseases. But yet Matthew points out that he saw a deeper tragedy, and that was their spiritual aimlessness. They were sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless, and he had compassion on them. That phrase, compassion, means that Jesus was stirred at the deepest level of his being. That the deep feelings in the heart and the affections overcame him, and he was moved to continue to minister to these people. As Jesus saw them, he didn't see them just as hurting people physically, but he saw people who were rejected, who were broken, people who were lonely, It was more than surface level. He saw broken hearts, and his heart broke with theirs. So how do we be a person, or become a person of compassion? Well, we see how Jesus modeled it, and we need to model that as well. First from this passage, we see Jesus modeled compassion when he went to the people. Did you catch that in verse 35? Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He went to the people. So that's what compassion does. Compassion is different from concern. For compassion, or excuse me, concern says somebody ought to do something. Compassion says I have to do something. Concern is you driving down the road on a hot summer day and seeing somebody with a flat tire. And you say, somebody needs to stop and help them. That's concern. Compassion is you slowing down, pulling over, or turning around and coming back and changing the flat that they have. The Lord calls us not to be people of concern, but to be people of compassion. Jesus took the primary responsibility to minister to the spiritual need by going to the people. He took the initiative to enter into their setting. Galilee during his time, this wasn't a peaceful place. It had large cities, people from all nations. It was a melting pot of people that were there, and Jesus went to them. He intentionally entered the lives of these people. He worshiped with them in their synagogues. We see that he went to their weddings. He worked with them in their fishing boats. He cried with them when one of them died. He knew who they were, and he knew their personal pain because he purposefully entered into their daily lives. And I'm sure that Jesus found himself in situations that didn't make him very comfortable. 
I mean, he went and stood up and preached in synagogues to people who didn't believe as he did and who didn't believe in him. He was close to people who were diseased and sick. And I'm sure there were some who were afraid that Jesus was going to catch what they had, especially that of leprosy, very contagious. And many thought, well, he come, they're going, Jesus is going to get it too. There were some who reminded Jesus, you touch that person, you become unclean by the law. And they would love to point that out to Jesus. That would not be very comfortable as well. There was the constant public shame upon Jesus because of the people that he was with. He went to them. And through the years, the church has forgotten this aspect of compassion. We expect people to come to us, not us go to them. For we have the attitude and we've spoken the words. They know where we are and they know when we meet. If they want to come, they'll come. And we wonder why the condition of our cities, our state, and our country has deteriorated because we have not gone to the people. Instead, we've made an idol of our comfort. We won't want to go to the places where they don't believe like we do. We don't want to go to the places where we may be shamed for hanging out with certain people. We don't want to go to the places afraid that they may rub off on us and we may catch what they have. And so we've isolated ourselves. But Jesus models for us, if we want to be people of generosity, we begin with being people of compassion who go to the people. I read the story about a summer missions that a college student was involved in in a low-income apartment complex. And she spent a lot of her time at the playground, at the apartment complex, that every afternoon kids would come. And they would line up. It was just this one college girl and all these kids. And she knew she could only give them one-on-one -on -one time as they took turns. And so she would wait for the next one to come. It would say, push me. Would you push me in the swing? And she would put them in the swing and she would push them and talk with them. When their time was up, the next person might say, would you, would you hold me so that I can do the monkey bars? And she would hold the kid as they went across. One would maybe climb up on the playground equipment and just holler, look at me, look at me. But she told the story about one girl named Crystal who waited in line for attention. She didn't want to play, but when it was her turn, she said, hold me. And the summer missionary picked the little girl up and she said she squeezed her like she never wanted to be put down again. And then she whispered the words in her ear, love me. It's time for the church to return to a real compassion. And stop looking at our ministry as something that somebody else does or something that happens on this platform and realize that all of us are to take personal responsibility to get out where the action is and love people. Wouldn't the salvation story be different if Christ waited for people to come to him? Most of us would probably still be destined for hell today. What would happen had he said, well, I'm going to sit here and the sick and the hurting and the lonely and the needy can come to me. But instead, Jesus was involved in their life, not isolated from them. And he's still doing the same work today. He's still working. He's still convicting us, still convicting people of their sin and their need for him. And before we ever get all prideful and all spiritual, let us remember that it was he who pursued us and offered us salvation, not us and our goodness pursuing him. He came to us. And he still goes to the people today through the work of his Holy Spirit that convicts and leads us to grace and to forgiveness. But he also goes to his people by sending us, by sending me and by sending you. Two weeks from today, three, maybe three, three weeks from today, It'll be October the 1st. That's our LOL day. Our Living Out Loud day where Sunday evening we're going to have steak dinner. We did this last year. We challenged you to invite steak dinner tickets at five bucks a piece to, to buy them for yourself. 
and to buy those for unchurched people that you know that will come with you that night. We'll do a service and then we'll feed them. Those were supposed to go on sale today, but thanks to the hurricanes, which I didn't know there was one out in California, has slowed down UPS, and uh, that's their excuse, and so those did not get delivered. So next week, you can begin to purchase those, but this week, I want you to be pondering and praying about who you need to go to. Who you need to go to and say, I bought this for you. You don't have to tell them that it's really inexpensive. I bought this for you, and I want you to come to church with me on this particular day and this particular time. It's not a fellowship time. There's no reason for you to buy an individual ticket and nothing else. It's a time that you invite those people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, those people who have dropped out of church. And you say, well, Clint, I don't know any. Come see me. I can give you the names of 50 families that kids came to vacation Bible school that are unchurched. And when we run out of those, I'll go to some other names that I could give you. I can take you to your neighbors. For some of you, I can tell you about your family members. I can remind you about that coworker that you have, that you've never gone to them. Or maybe you have, but you haven't in a long time because you've been frustrated from their response in the past. I'm glad the Lord never gets frustrated with me. I'm glad he never got frustrated in calling me, but that he continues to do so. And you and I must show the same persistence and determination as well. We must go to the people the Lord has sent us. If we're going to be people of compassion, secondly, notice Jesus saw the people. Obviously, yes, you say he, he saw the, the people. I mean, he had his eyes open. But you know there's a difference between hearing and listening. There's also a difference between seeing a person and actually seeing who they are. Jesus looked at these people, and he saw them not as a bunch of folks in a crowd, but he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. For Jesus knew the, the leaders of Israel had not fulfilled their responsibility to protect and to guide the people, and therefore they were harassed and they were helpless. They're experiencing all sorts of difficulties. They're unable to care for themselves. But rather than making sure that the sheep, that the people are being led beside still waters and lacking in nothing, these leaders are harassing the helpless crowds. They're just mocking them. They're toying with them. They're having a great time at their expense. They're suffering under the oppressive Roman forces. They have all the daily concerns and heartbreaks and difficulties of life beating down on them. And Jesus looked at them, and he saw them as people, not as problems. If Jesus looked at our problems, he would never come close. He would run the other direction. But he looks at us and he sees us as people. He looked into this crowd, into every soul that was there. He didn't see a number, but he saw people that he knew and that he understood and that he feels for. And the same is true today. God doesn't have you numbered, but he knows you by name. And he knows where you hurt. And he knows where you're frustrated. He knows where you're tired. He knows where you're weak. He knows where you're ready to quit. He feels for you. And he doesn't see you by the problem maybe that everybody else would. Or maybe in the problem that you see yourself as. Instead, he looks at you as a child of God. One created in the image of God. One that his son died for. And that's a lesson that we need to learn. For we often look and we see the people, we see the drunk, and we see the thief. And we see the liar and the adulterer and the lazy. And I mean, we just look at all these, all these titles we give out. But as we go to the people, we've got to learn to see the people. And to see past that and to see the person. Created in God's image, it's not living up to that image. But I don't want you to think that Jesus overlooked the problems. He didn't look and go, well, forget about that. Let's look to the person. No. He focused on forgiveness. He didn't condemn. 
Rather, he told the people from tur- to turn from their, sick- their wicked ways and to accept him. Go and sin no more, he tells the woman caught in adultery. Go and have a changed life. See, we love to talk and to preach about the wickedness of society, but we forget to offer a solution. We love to point out how bad things are, but we forget to tell people that the solution is Jesus. And there's no other name under heaven and earth by which men are saved. As Jesus went, he sought conversion, not just conformity. You know, we want people to behave correctly. And that often becomes more important to us than their salvation. See, the great sin of the church is that we really don't care if people are saved. We just want them to act correctly. But Jesus came and he placed great great value on the harvest. And he saw people and he called them to follow him. Probably the greatest example outside of Jesus that we have in Scripture is that of the Good Samaritan. Probably familiar with the story that a man is beaten on a road that was known for people being robbed and beaten and left for dead, and a particular man is there. And he thinks that his fortunes are looking up when he knows that a priest is coming. <clears throat> if anybody would help, he would think it'd be the most godly man around, one who was supposed to be, and we know that the priest went by on the other side. Then some other, other religious guy comes along. He'll help, no. But the Samaritan, the one that a Jew wouldn't even pay any attention to. A Jew in a regular day wouldn't want a Samaritan to touch him. Yet in this case, this Jew needed that Samaritan. You know the story, the Samaritan put the injured man on the back of his own donkey and began to walk. He got to the hotel would you put him up for the night? Here's some money to take care of him as long as he needs to stay. I'll come back through and I'll settle the bill with you. And it's there that you and I see modeled generosity and compassion. That this man moved by compassion went and he met the needs of someone who was left to die. And when he took him to the end, he didn't say, here's just for one night or just for a couple of nights. But as long as he needs to stay, I'll come back and settle up. That's the generosity in which you and I need to follow. To no longer put limits on what we're going to allow God to do in and through us. So often we say, God, you know, I, I, I can give you the time on Sunday, but we're not generous with our time and giving you other time. God, I can even give you a few minutes every morning. I can spend time in your word and in prayer, but you know, I've had a full day the rest of the day. But this Samaritan showed us that he was willing to go however far he had to go to meet the need that existed. And we must be people that will do the same. Quit putting limits on God. Quit idolizing our comfort and be willing to go to the people and see the people for who they are. And those two points don't really, we can talk about how the Lord went to the people and how he saw the people and we can leave and that may not affect us as much as this next one. But when Jesus modeled compassion, he sent the people. He sent us. Verse 37, Jesus looked at his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus is there looking at the crown, harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He is moved to compassion for them. And as his heart breaks, seeing these people, he's looking at the crown. The harvest is plentiful. And then he turns to look at his disciples. And he's got those 12 guys. The workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And things haven't changed much. The harvest 
is still plentiful. But those who are willing to be people of compassionate generosity are few. And it's important for us to notice in verse 38 that Jesus doesn't say to pray for the harvest, but to pray for the workers. The harvest is already there. Think about your prayers. We oftentimes pray for the Lord to do great things, and we should pray for that. I've been praying as we near October the 1st to be in prayer for the LOL day, that God would let us see a spiritual harvest that day. The harvest is there. We had to take advantage of the harvest. See, the problem is not a lack of people hurting. It's not a lack of prospects. It's not a lack of people who don't know Jesus. But the the problem is the lack of laborers going out and bringing them in. Think about harvesting. Where's harvesting done? Out in the field. Not a trick question. Done outside. Which takes us back to we have to go to the people. For years, the church has been guilty of sitting in our comfort waiting for the harvest. But the harvest is outside. Jesus said to pray for the Lord to send workers into his harvest field. And churches have forgotten that. Baptist churches are some of the worst. For you've heard the police. You've seen them in your bulletin. You've heard them from here. Through the years, you may have been guilt tripped. you Some of you, many of you served on the nominating committee, and you know the attitude becomes, who can we get to do this? Who has not told us no? And so that person is selected, not based upon a need, but just that they might would do it. And the Lord tells us to pray for workers in the harvest field. You know why I don't believe we do that? It's because we know when we pray that prayer, we might be the answer to the prayer. You don't pray that prayer because you might be the answer. The Lord may say, you're the one to go. You're the one to do. What we have to understand is that you hear pleas for help. You see those in your bulletin, they're in our newsletter, they take a lot of the energy that we have. What we have to understand is that we have all of the manpower to do the ministry that we want to do and then some. Right in here. It's here today. God has given us everything that we need to do everything that He's called us to do. But we have to be people of compassionate generosity until then we won't ever go to the people we won't ever see them but for their problems so you don't need to expect to have a passion for people until you go to them you don't need to expect God to give you a a heavy burden for your neighbor until you get to know their needs you don't need to expect for God to put you in charge of something great when you're slow to be in charge of something small. You don't need to expect God to use you to reach others until you're willing to be gripped with compassion that leads you to be generous with all that you have and all that you are. We are a sent people, but sadly we're a sent people who often stay. There's an old song that had the phrase in it, made me the title of it, my house is full, but my fields are empty. And I think that is sadly is a picture of the modern day church. We gather, our house is full, but the harvest fields are empty. You know that when the harvest comes, you've got to get the crop out. You've got a set amount of time to do that. We've got folks who can't be here today because time is of the essence. 
And it's even worse when there's forecasted rain coming in. That time to get it out is even shorter than maybe it was before. Why? Because the end of the harvest time is coming. And it's coming quickly. And someday soon, our Lord is going to return. And the time to gather the harvest is short. But it's time now. Rather than giving all we have and being generous, we've held back. So church today, don't you think it's time we got in the field? Don't you think we left and sacrificed, smashed the idol of comfort? Sacrificed where necessary so that we could be involved in the harvest. So will you today, will you be willing to respond that way? To be moved with generous, with compassionate generosity? Or will we leave like we do any other day and gather once again at the house full and the fields empty? Your choice today will determine what you harvest, if anything, this week. Would you pray with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed today, I want you to consider where you're at right now. Are you in the field or are you in the house? Are you involved in the harvest or are you expecting that to happen from someone else? And then I want you to consider what you have that you can give So the harvest will be seen. What time, what lessons have you learned? What experiences do you need to share? Father God, in this place today, we admit our guilt of being people who are selfish. Maybe not in one or two areas, but Lord, overall in our life. There are areas in our life where we have held back. We'll only go so far in those areas. Today, Lord, it's time for us, for us to smash the idol of comfort. It's time for us to become people of generosity, to clothe ourselves with compassion. So let us make decisions during this time that make us such a people. Lord, thank you that you came to us. You pursued us. You pursued us through your Spirit even today as we've gathered here. Now let us be obedient. In the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand together? And as we sing this morning, would you come? Maybe this altar you needs to be the place where you come and symbolically smash that idol of comfort. Maybe you've got a personal or public decision to make. Would you come this morning? Let us be obedient to the Lord as we sing. Just as I am.
Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, I thank you so much for the words you put on Brother Clint's heart today. Lord, to help us to be a more generous and compassionate people, not with just our money, but with our time and talents also. Lord, we just ask you to be with, with us as we give our tithes and offerings that you'll bless them. Help us to use them to furnish your kingdom. We ask these things in your name. Amen. it's an honor to worship with you this morning. I thank you for your attendance. I hope that you'll see the opportunities that we have to be together and serve together and that you will be plugged in. One of those this evening at five o'clock as we begin our adult small groups. You see those that are listed there and uh, just a couple of, of additions. First of all, that computers do crazy things and what's 
was on one computer, not on another. But there is a group missing on your bulletin. That uh, is a group meeting at Paulette Kilpatrick's house. And also, there's a little change there. The ladies group is going to meet at Pam McLeod's house. So if you need uh, directions, either one of those, uh, I'm going to ask those two ladies, if y'all just kind of hang around in the back, and, uh, or, or you can see me, and we'll, uh, we'll get you pointed toward them or toward their house. So I hope you'll be plugged in to one of those groups this evening. If there's not a group, uh, for maybe particularly for your age, then we have asked for you to be here to assist with Awana this evening. Also, as we wrap up today, for, we're having an interest meeting to be involved in Chile, the early part of next year. So we're going to gather here in the choir loft here at the front uh, after we wrap up this morning. I encourage you to stay for just a few minutes as we talk about those possibilities as well. Minnie Kay and Molly, if y'all would come. and uh, I'm going to start with age over beauty, if that's oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't no problem to figure out who it was. No, it wasn't. They knew where I was starting, didn't they? Uh, it's an honor today to have Benny Kay, who desires membership in our church, a promise of a letter from Hillcrest Baptist Church, and then to have Molly, who uh, Wednesday evening accepted the Lord and uh, committed her life to Him. I told you they would be happy, and uh, she's scared to death, and I know the feeling, um, but Molly desires, of course, to, to follow in baptism. And uh, Benny had given me a, given me a note that, uh, of folks that, who invested in him, who were generous to him, who were compassionate to him, that he wanted to thank today. And, and that being Steve Roark and Pat Rush and Frank Gray, a uh, pretty rough crew. And uh, then his sister, Miss Jackie Varner. And uh, I guess every, every man with a sister knows they always have to keep you in line. That's right. And... Uh, I, I would imagine if I were talked to Molly and her parents, there would be appreciation for Sunday school teachers and for Awana workers and for Wednesday night workers that her parents are now part of that have invested in her, VBS workers. Uh, so know the opportunity that we have to see lives change as we are people of compassionate generosity. I want these to see that you're going to welcome them, you're going to support them, and you celebrate with them today. And as a sign of that, would you raise your right hand? And guys, you see folks that are proud of you today and glad to have you here. And after we sing, if you would come back here and stand and let them come and officially welcome you and our church family and let you know how, how proud of you they are, Molly. All right, so y'all can have a seat there. And our, you can just everybody can stand. Y'all don't have to sit down yet. Let's stand together. And as we wrap up this morning, as we go, let it be our prayer that the Holy Spirit would rain down upon us as we go.